Welcome everybody to this World Satsang on the 28th of July 2018 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show and I thank Kevin as usual for putting the World Satsang onto his YouTube channel uh, which is called The Moore Show and there's also more talk there as well where Kevin has a number of different interviews with different individuals of, of note from the met metaphysical and spiritual worlds. Okay so this particular uh, World Satsang is going to have quite a lot of questions so I'll have to get on with my my talk, which is about the versions of event space. We'll then go through the questions, and then I'm going to do a meditation to release links that uh, stop us from moving forward in our incarnation. And, and actually these links can be classified as links we have with people, or links we have with ourselves in previous incarnations, so that things we've brought through with us that, um, if, you want to, if you want to call it, cause a problem with us in this particular incarnation are sometimes linked with us and so we can remove those links as well. So it's links with people, um, those people can be also a karmic link as well, and links with, our, with ourselves in previous incarnations. And usually the, these links with ourselves in previous incarnations are um, to do with how we've left our incarnation. And so sometimes people who have uh, a bad neck in this incarnation um, tend to have been hanged in a previous incarnation and so we can remove those links and that stops that physical manifestation of that link and the person can move forward. So it's part of a, part of a healing process as well. So we'll go through that, it's quite a simple meditation process um, and I'll be guiding you through that at the end. Okay so let's have a look at the, the versions of event space and it's interesting this is because um, I've uh, been developing a uh, a presentation for one of the conferences I'm going to next year called the multi-dimensional show which is actually held in Birmingham in the UK and um, one of the things this, this particular presentation is called the road to sentience uh, and the greater reality and part of it is to do with event space so all of the information I'm going to be talking about today is going to be in that presentation as well so event space really is what um, we exist within within the space that is within the, the source with, within the space that the source is in within the, the origin. It's, it pervades the origin, therefore it pervades the source, therefore it pervades our multiverse, therefore it pervades our universe. And it, it is what we exist within. We don't exist in a time-space-time continuum, so to speak. We exist in a, an event space, um, a volume of event space that we, that we sort of create around ourselves. So. Event space can loosely be considered as, as like a rubber band ball and it's a good, good, it's a good illustration of how it inter interacts with each other because we know that we, we can, that time doesn't exist and therefore if time doesn't exist we can go from one event to another event provided we know how to do it and um, we can do it mechanically with, with different technologies or we can do it uh, as a function of a higher frequency um, ability so to speak or, or, or capabilities. But if you think of event space as a rubber band ball, and each rubber band is a particular event space, then each rubber band is in either direct contact or indirect contact through other rubber bands with every other rubber band within the rubber band ball. And so everything exists in the same volume and is, in, is, in, is either in direct or indirect contact with, it, with each other. And, and they, so therefore, it can be mo we can move from one event space to another, to another event space. But a, in, in understanding what event space is in, in terms of rubber band ball gives us an idea of how we might be able to to move through it. But um, event space can be classified as really as an aerial volume of space within the source that exists in a parallel function of that space. It's, uh, it's sort of space overlapping space or space within and without a space. Everything exists in terms of events, not in terms of time, which I've just discussed basically. Event space can be duplicated or parallelized because of the creation of a new event space is the result of a collective or individualized desire and is usually one of a number of possibilities or probabilities that are aligned to the current event space and event stream. We are, I'm going to talk about event, the other types of event space in a moment but also, and also realities because they, they link in with event space. Event space can, uh, however, expand and contract as necessary within its own space 
so when a single entity through its desires, intentions, thoughts and actions does something on its own, it may be capable of creating an event space lo lo local to itself. However, in the events that the actions of the entity are enough to make other entities change their own ideas, des desires, uh, intentions, thoughts and behaviours and actions, then it can invoke a new event space via that collective desire and therefore we get larger event spaces. So what we can, as a result of that, if we get event spaces within event spaces, what, what are these, you know, what, what demarks the difference between them? And so we can get something called the demarcation between event spaces. And this is the line of non-interaction drawn between one event space and another. And we have to note though that an insufficient demarcation line can result in the integrity of an event space, uh, sorry, can result in the lack of integrity of an event space and therefore create an alternative reality instead. Sufficient demarcation results in a robust event space. And so what we have is there needs to be a demarcation between one event and another event, something that separates it. And without that separation, it becomes linked to the, the, the previous event space, but can create a different reality within it, which is something else. So based upon this, this thing about having a demarcation line, it, it's logical to think we, we, we can have something called a start of event. And uh, the, within the start of an event, event space can allow any changes to have its own start of event, even when there appears to be no real start. A start or beginning is therefore not a temporal position, time doesn't exist, it is simply a function of a change of experiential direction to create a new individualised experiential direction. And so basically it's, it's, it's up to us, We've, we, we will create this. Okay? Logically speaking, if there's a start of event, there's therefore an end of event. An event space can, so in terms of the event of, uh, end of event, event space can allow any changes to have its own end of event, even when there appears to be no real end. So it's almost the, the sort of reciprocating opposite of, of the start of event. Uh, an end is therefore also not a temporal position, it is a function of finalisation and of an individualised experiential direction. So it's, it, it, is a, it is totally the reciprocal of the start of the event. Which, is, um, which, which, which creates this demarcation line and, and allows event spaces to be within event spaces. Okay. The, when we have a number of events following each other, we have something called an event stream. And the, an event stream is the expected direction of a series of natural events within an event space. And these are identified as an event stream. So if you think about it, if you think of event space as a bubble, and event spaces within event spaces are bubbles within bubbles, then these event spaces that, that link together um, even though they may have a start of event and end of event, they may be a logical sequence that creates a join between that, the end of one event and the start of another event. The end of one event space and the start of another event space. Bearing in mind that this start and end is a human concept about what event space is. It helps us to understand it. Isn't, it is not going to be the ultimate description of what event space is. It, it would be too difficult for us to, for us to understand in this particular frequency. So we have to work on it uh, in a way that we can understand it and, and move forwards. Okay. Now then, the interesting thing is there's something called an event space horizon. And this is when all the events that are concurrently represented in the same space are observed by an entity. The collective images of all the environments created by those event spaces appear to be a white horizon on a white background. This effect is created when the entity cannot divide the different environments represented by the different event spaces into separate images, creating sensory overload and this sort of white on white effect. The use of the words event horizon, used to describe the proof of a black hole or wormhole, as we would call them, are therefore no surprise because it just, everything blends into one. And, and I've experienced this with Source Entity 12 in Beyond the Source um, 2, where in essence, it was it was showing me all links to all event spaces at once, and it, I became extremely giddy and, and almost sort of passed out with the with the imagery. But basically, that went, that became a blur and just became white, and there was no way I could um, understand, ascertain, separate out anything that I was seeing. It just became white on white. Okay. Now we've we talked about events dreams and event spaces, but there's something called an event stream bubble. Now, this is, this is also something which is interesting because it's where each event is a bubble of interaction between an entity or being and the environment it's working in. 
the bubbles of events can grow and explode into another bubble or shrink and implode into nothingness. Bubbles that grow sometimes explode into another bubble that is nearby creating a new but combined bubble. Okay, they can explode into a new, new bigger bubble, allowing them to cope with an expansion of, of, of fractal events, or event fractals, depending on how you want to say it, that are still combined together in the space, the event space, which was created for the original and static event stream. Those bubbles of events that shrink and implode either disappear totally, thus, re re thus representing the end of that particular event stream, or they can implode and reappear in another event, when a bubble has a naturally ended, ended its usefulness, it implodes back into the originating event stream bubble. So what we have here is the, the creation of events and event streams within event spaces as a bubble of events with and event streams. Very complicated to think that everything that's happening around us is, is subject to these different types of rules, so to speak, or, or should, not so much rules, more um, functionality. Okay, there's also something called a micro event space and it's really a microscopically small event space that is specific to the needs of an individual entity, being or environment. And so really it's, um, it's something which is so small it is, it is almost, you know, it can almost be individual sized, you know, human sized or room sized. Okay, so, it, so this is something which is, which is worthwhile considering that we have, we can have our own event spaces. But, we, but something called realities are also linked into it as well. So I'm going to give you some information about realities as well, not just, not just event spaces, because realities are created through event spaces being generated. Parallel conditions are something that we're all interested in. Now a parallel condition is the duplication of event space. It is the creation or generation of a new but similar event space when a choice can be made and that choice or the possibility of the choice, or the possible possibility of that choice results in a large, large enough downstream differential to create a new series of experiences that are self-contained and independent of the event space they separate it from. So in the, within this, the overall size of the event space is a function of the inclusion of other entities or beings that interact with the initiating and subsequent downstream experiences generated from the initial choice. So this is, this is how parallel conditions get created. Now, uh, a parallel condition is a, is a creation of a parallel universe, for instance. The parallel universe is created through the generation of event spaces of the various different types we've talked about. Within all of these is something called reality. And the reality is simply an environment and interactive condition we create as a desired function of an event space or event stream. It is an entity or being generated perception based condition. It's what we feel the event space is doing for us. And the, in effect, we get, we, get, we get a lot of this because it's, you know, we, we create our own realities around ourselves. And one person's reality is completely different to somebody else's reality whilst in the same event space. Because there's going to be links between the individuals that support the, the continued existence of that event space even though their personal realities are different, or maybe even their alternative reality. Because an alternative reality is a personal or group-based perception or, or desire for a certain experiential environment within a known environment relative, relative to their thoughts, behaviours and actions, and the desire to ignore that which one doesn't desire to interact with. This is a good way of describing people who get involved with things like conspiracy theory. They choose to work with the conspiracies rather than hard evidence which is something to, to think about, you know. We create that which we want to create around us. Birds of a feather flock together. We like to work with people who think in the same way as us and therefore we create our own reality within an overall event space. But there are such things as overall reality. <laughs> and the overall reality is the experiential condition that is created by the existence of the sentience that is the origin. It contains all of its personal experiences, growth, realizations, creations and explorations of self. It is the only reality that can be considered static in function and observation. It is what we are part of. So everything we, we do um, within the source is a function of this overall reality within the origin. And in fact, everything we do is part of the origin's overall reality anyway. Then we can go into um, various demarcations of reality as well. And I'll start at the top and work, work my way down. 
because um, there are such things as multiversal reality. And a multiversal reality is the experiential condition that is created by the governing entities responsible for a specific mark of multiversal environment within a specific source entity. It is a generalized function of reality and is subject to change both by the planners, other curator functions, see the book The Curators when it comes out, little plug there, and the interactions of the incumbent beings that are working within that environment. Okay, so that's the way to think about it really, is, is that the multiversal reality is something which is, which is containing all of the realities as well. So let's look about the, the universal reality, which is a subset of a multiversal reality. Because it's a smaller representation of the multiversal reality, in so much as it starts out to be when a, when, when a multiverse and its universal components are first introduced as a medium for evolutionary progression. The universal reality can only be changed as a result of all entities within that environment choosing to change the reality as a total collective. So if everybody in our particular universe wanted to move in a certain direction and change everything relevant to a, a collective desire, then we can change the universal reality to, to being um, concurrent with that desire. Other than that, it becomes smaller, such as a global reality, because a global reality is a further dissection of the overall theme of a reality. It is relevant to an area within a universal reality that affects a large but not significant number of entities within the universal environment. The global reality can therefore be described in terms of, of being akin to an area the size of a galaxy. And that's the way to think about it, really. It, it, a global reality isn't specifically uh, on a planet. It can be the size of a galaxy, really. That's, that's the, sort of the size of it. That's my way I'm, I'm working it anyway. If, if, if the listeners or the readers of, of, of my books want to consider it in a different way, you can do. It's what you're comfortable with that makes it work, okay? Local realities are, are a, a, a further dissection. It is the official start of convolution within realities. This is a reality within a reality within the universal reality. Local realities can vary in size and number of interactive entities. Local realities are, no, are normally created, um, by the way, when a, a group of entities choose to not only change the function of their interaction with the overall reality, but actively choose to disassociate any previous knowledge with the former reality itself. So they, this, this is when, like I say, people group together and create their own reality, live in their own um, environments, for instance, um, like in a, in a, um, a kibbutz, for instance, or a, a, a small community, or simply interact with others of the same thought, uh, thought processes as well. The next one is a locally individualized reality, which is, a rel which is relative to small groups of entities within a local reality, such as those living within a certain country. And uh, this occurs when entities are aware of the local reality, but are unable to change the reality that has been changed for them by more influential uh, entities. Uh, and I guess this is, <laughs> with some of us are experiencing some of this right now with some of, some of the um, rather bizarre changes to reality that our, our governments are making. <laughs> So this is, um, this, is, this is a good example of how we can exist in a reality but not change it because it's, it's, it's influenced by other entities or beings which are more powerful, so to speak, and have more ability, therefore, to change the reality that is around us. Okay. The individualised reality is the, is the final step down. That's, this is the smallest reality we can have. It is what entities with individualised free will choose to create around them. And in some instances, the, the fully individualized reality can create full separation from the greater reality. This is when somebody um, becomes a hermit, for instance, or, 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 or goes and disappears or becomes in, you know, separated out from society. They live in their own world, they live in their own house, they don't interact with others. And so this is a, a, an individualized reality that still interacts with the locally individualized and the local reality and the global reality and the universal reality and ultimately the multiversal reality, but it is specific to that individual in their own, their, their own particular space. Okay, so that's the, uh, <laughs> the total description of what these different realities are. Um, but I, you, you, you might notice that I, I started to call things entities and beings. And um, there is a difference between an entity and a being. And I, and I would suggest that you, when it comes out, read the, the full dialogue that um, I ended up writing down with my talks with the source entity on this, because 
in essence, an entity is an individualized unit of sentience given a body of energies by the division of sentience away from a higher entity by that higher entity. For our trin entity selves, that's our, our TES, um, being separated out or individualized from source. Or from the soul's perspective, it is the individualization of sentient and sentience and energy from the, the true energetic self. Whereas a being is something different. It's an individualized unit of sentience that is developed independently by the function of similar, same or sympathetic energies collecting together and evolving over a period of time. Time doesn't exist over a period is a better way of saying it. But this, this is what you could classify as being Darwinian sort of uh, evolution where, you know, different en energies get attracted to each other and, and grow in size and then there's, there's, there becomes a, a desire to group together with other energies of the same type or similar type and then create something bigger and it starts to grow. That movement away from um, a desire becomes a sort of a, a very minor intelligence requirement to group together and then it becomes intelligence, then it becomes self-aware and even conscious and, and everything else. That takes, a, that takes a long period but in essence the difference between a being and an entity is, is, is that in a, in a particular evolutionary cycle the entity has more capabilities or more abilities or functionality than a being but when they, they, they both get reinserted into a new evolutionary cycle they're both equal it's just that that particular evolutionary cycle the one has gained sentience through a, an evolutionary route rather than through a um, an individualized route by a higher entity giving individualization to its own sentience and energy to create a smaller version of itself and but, but once he's gone through this evolutionary cycle it gains the same level of status time for another book i think in that instance okay so let's move on to the questions we've got and uh we're not doing too badly in terms of the time so i'm really pleased i apologize if i speak quickly but um <laughs> this is this is how i work and for, so um hopefully the transcript will come out from the lovely lady U us who um, takes on board the transcription and uh, writes it all down for you for those people who can't understand my West Midlands accent. Okay, this is a, a British West Midlands accent, which is a bit of a mixture of everything. Right, first questions. Um, and this is to do with incarnation, basically. It's, it's by the Lady US and some of the, in, some of the people who uh, interact with her through her, her own website. Why are the physical vehicles limited in the number in the physical universe? So the higher selves have to queue up to send souls to incarnate. That's the general question. There's some sub questions, sub sections to this. Why shouldn't some higher selves create more bodies for souls to use at any location or any point in time, meaning event space? Um, why do they have to have to transport different vehicles or racial forms to our planet uh, from elsewhere in the, in the universe at different time points? Oh, that's a separate one. I'll work on that. And why were they not created right here in situ to, be, to begin with as needed? Right, well, the first question and the first subsection to that question are really one question. And the answer to that, question, and that, the answer to that is basically um, there is a, a certain amount of, shall we say, bodies, bodies or vehicles that can be supported by a particular planet. Okay? And so from our perspective, there are only a certain number of individuals who can be created um, to support that. And certainly on Earth, from an Earth perspective, there has to be a level of governance associated with the number of individuals because we've all got individualised free will. And this individualised free will is, is unique to the, um, the physical universe, basically. And it's, it's unique to any, multi, any, any universe within, within the uh, multiverse apart from Obviously, when we're, when we're energetic, we are normally part of a larger collective of our self and, and source. But um, from, an in, from, a, from an individualized incarnate perspective, we are, all planets have the ability to sustain only a certain number of, of vehicles. Um, some of them are in, are, are in tens of billions, some of them are only in hundreds of thousands. It just depends upon the type of environment that's there and what can be supported and the way in which those, in, those incarnate individuals within those vehicles that they have can interact with that environment as well. For, for instance, the Earth right now has, I don't know the exact figure, but I, I guess it's around 7 billion um, inhabitants. It has been significantly lower down than that. It's been in the 
the, the hundreds, hundreds of thousands in the past has been in this, the, small, the small millions as well. We're, we're, we are supposedly enjoying a population boom right now and that's happened certainly, certainly in the last four to five hundred years. Um, but, it, but the earth can only support a, a, a maximum number of um, incarnate individuals as well and I'm being told that's probably around between, I'm being told it's between 12 and 14 billion is the maximum the Earth can support, provided we are working together to support the Earth in supporting us. The way we're doing it right now, it can only support another, another 2 billion, up to 9 billion in, inhabitants. But if we worked together and supported it and everything, and everything was recycled and we, 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 we didn't waste anything, and we created things and we worked with the planet properly, we could support between 12 and 14 billion. So that's why there's, <laughs> that's why there's um, only a certain number of bodies available, basically, in this particular environment. And, and it's also why there's, there's not so many in the rest of the physical universe. And also, don't forget, the other incarnate vehicles in the rest of the physical universe are governed by some form of collective consciousness together. Um, whether it's fully collective or whether it's individualized free will that has to work with the governance of being a collective as well is it, a different thing. Where, whereas we have fully individualized free will that doesn't need to work with a collective. Okay, so that's uh, hopefully, hopefully that, that answers that question. It's simply because of the, the, what's, a, what's able to be sustained on the, on the, on the planet that it's, um, they're, they're working with. Why do they have to transport different vehicles or racial forms um, at different points? Um, and why were they not created here in situ? Well, the first ones were created here in situ. They were created um, as a result of the higher frequency um, period that we were in, and the human vehicle was, has been adapted a number of different times. But there were other human forms, and there are other human forms even now that are around the um, physical universe, that are naturally of a higher frequency or, or in this instance they were naturally of a lower frequency and so it was more effective or efficient to import these vehicles uh, from other, other locations within the physical universe and other galaxies that were able to support to support and work with and be supported by the environment of the earth uh, and also more importantly exist within the, the, the reduction in frequencies. So they were imported because it was easier to do basically than, than create new, new, vehicle, new, new bodies. Sometimes it's better to import a vehicle like a motor car from another country than it is to redesign one yourself. <laughs> and it's the same sort of thing. It was basically there was other vehicle, other, other human type vehicles around that were capable of, of existing in lower frequencies um, because our, our earth was dropping down the frequencies and the existing vehicles couldn't cope with the drop in frequency. And that was the reason for it for that. Uh, the next part of the question is: In the last satsang, you said that unless we humans can master individualized free will, other incarnating souls will not be given individualized free will to accelerate their evolution through the physical universe. Um, and the subsection to this: Haven't we done this? Have, haven't we done this Earth free will experiment twice already in our previous multiversal cycles, or is this the first time we are being given individualized free will? in the third multiversal um, well, evolutionary cycle. Uh, is the individualized free will only given to souls from higher selves that are fully sentient, i.e. human level, and not to backfill or human plant or even mineral level entities? Or do they all get the same point in the incarnate experience? Um, individualized free will, I am being told, is a function of this particular evolutionary cycle. Um, and it's only a recent addition to the evolutionary cycle. I have to say, as well, I'm picking up now. It's it's you know it's only in the last um, million or so years where it's been it's been used or or, or being um, introduced into this particular location within the, within the physical universe within the multiverse. So it's. Um, it's it's a unique thing in all in all sorts of ways, and because it's unique, um, it has various different evolutionary opportunities. 
which were discussed at its high level. And one of these functions of giving ourselves individualized free will is that we, we would um, drop down the frequencies, but we could also go up the frequencies and become become something much bigger and much better. The, the issue with it is that we are currently dropping down, but we have the capability to reduce this and stop this drop and increase and benefit from experiencing lower frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions and apply um, governance of ourselves whilst incarnate to ensure we don't go down these levels again and we learn and subsequently evolve from being in the lower in the, in the lower levels because we can see how difficult it is and how damaging it can be to others who incarnate and the environment around us. The only other souls that are allowed to have individualized free will are those souls that are in between that what should I say the those souls that have sentience which is which is the quality of sentience that is in between the human and the animal. Now they are only a recent in inclusion, even more recent than, 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 than having individualized free will. And the backfield people are, they've only been here no more than 50 years, 50, 60 years. And so they, they are specifically being allowed to incarnate to allow those of higher sentience, higher, the higher quality of sentience to ascend into the higher frequencies whilst still being on earth. So they're here to help us. But they do because they're because they're a lower 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 quality of sentience. They do get sucked into low frequency thoughts, behaviours, and actions. But they will also benefit from the uh, the ability to incarnate and have individualised free will as well. So eventually they will evolve as well. Okay, and the, the last sort of question on this particular angle is: When souls reincarnate, is there a maximum or minimum or average time that is spent between lives before a soul can reincarnate back into human form? Uh, no, <laughs> we can, provided we have the the, uh, the authority to come into what I call back-to-back -back lives, we can go into one from one incarnation to another incarnation, or we can spend millennia away from incarnating. It just depends upon what our true energetic self has got in store for this particular individualization of its sentience, or our souls, um, or whether there's a, an overall plan to experience something that spans a number of different lives. Um, it's really, it, it really is a case of what is part of the overall big plan to experience, learn and evolve. And it can be that we can be here instantaneously in the next body, or we can go into walk-ins and you know, go leave one body which has died and then walk into another body which is already mature. So there's no, there is, there is no, if you want to call it this, there's no sort of maximum or minimum or average time it's just completely individualized as to, as to what we do and how we do it but it's completely individualized based upon what's available for us and how important we're what we're going to experience is in the overall picture and so our guides and helpers and the guides and helpers of other souls and our, all of our true energetic selves have a much bigger plan that we that is 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 so massive that we would never be able to understand it in our human con human condition but basically everything is is there and the, the whole point of evolution experience is, is laid out in front of us i would suggest that the the, the person who asked this particular question reads the end dialogues because that goes into a bit more detail as to what, what we do in between our lives um, but he, but in essence we are sort of governed by the, the desires of our true energetic self. Uh, but we can all, but depending upon our own evolutionary level within the evolutionary level of our true energetic self, we can also influence our true energetic self as well, if we have a plan. And, and that depends upon the type of um, re-communion with our true energetic self we have. Okay. Good questions though, good questions. Next question is from DC, uh, who asks, Towards the end of the History of God book, page 387, chapter 32, the Source Entity and the Council of Twelve is, is, is commented upon. And so the question came up uh, for, for the group that DC is part of uh, about help. So the, how, how, is it, how, how can one properly ask for help from, this, from the Source and, and, the, and the Council of Twelve? Um, my understanding is that these individuals don't get involved I mean, the source entity we can always 
connect, we can, yeah, we're all connected to the source entity because we're all smaller uh, subsets of individualization of, of sentient energy from the source. But my understanding is that is that the Council of Twelve um, are more involved with the governance of the local of the multiversal environment, and and should I say they will be involved in the particular aspect of well, of a particular frequency within the within the physical universe as well. So they would not really be intera interacting with us as such, but you can, if you wanted to meditate on gaining help via the true energetic self. So the true energetic self can also be classified as the oversoul or, or godhead or higher self. And so you could request for generalized help in guidance or things that would help us make better decisions, so to speak, or, or go through better decision processes. Um, so that's 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 one way of thinking about it, is that we could do it that way. The, the, my understanding is the Council of Twelve would, aren't, in, aren't particularly involved with what we're doing because they have other roles to play. They're, again, they're part of this, this set of entities and beings called the Curators. So again, when that, book, that, when that book comes out, that might help people to understand it in more detail. Okay. Next part of this question from DC is, all through my life I was told that my guiding angel, because of free will, would stand by and not offer assistance or help unless I ask for it. In other words, if I did not ask a guiding angel to help, it, it would be stand there watching. Is this true? Well, well, the guardian angel is really your, your main guide. Um, the word angel is an old, an old English or old European word to explain something which is magnificent when observed. Uh, angelic is a way of describing magnificence. Um, and also the, the, the inability to understand the energies animating from them when they manifest a, uh, a form that is just able to work with this particular low frequency environment. But they're always there working with us. Um, we're always able to communicate with our, <coughs> excuse me, our guides and our helpers. Um, and sometimes that information comes out in various different ways. I always tell people if they want to meditate on their guide, just, just meditate on the guide and ask for, ask for help or direction and guidance. But be aware that the, the direction and guidance might come through a number of different modalities. It can be um, from a clairvoyant perspective, you can may, may see things in your mind's eye, maybe clairaudience, hear things in your mind's ear, or clairsentience, just a knowingness. It can also come through guidance through dreams or images through dreams. It can also come through uh, various different things being said to us by family or friends, work colleagues, and even things we see on the TV sometimes or other things that are happening around us, like reading, like reading a paper. So sometimes they can give us the information we want or, or, or point us in the right direction by using the natural uh, functions of the media that we used, both, both metaphysically and, and physically around us. So it's simply a case of meditating and knowing you can contact them. Don't just believe it, know it, and then, and then, you'll, then you'll get information in one of those various different modalities I've just described. The uh, other question is, I've often had dialogues with spirit, uh, with spirit will throughout the day, and at the end of the day when I'm reviewing my day, I often feel disappointed for not asking for particular help with difficult situations. So can we ask for help? Should we ask for help? Why should we ask for help or why should we not ask for help? And who particularly should, ask, should we ask for help from? Is it our higher self or our friends or source entity? An origin, master guides, help, uh, helper guides. If you can help us, we'd be grateful. Um, I would suggest that you work on your main guides first. The main guides are the ones who are closely connected to you. Clearly sources as well. But the, 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 the main guide and the helpers are those who are ex expert in you as an individual. They, they know what you've, what you've experienced in previous incarnations, they know what you've brought in to this incarnation in terms of desires uh, for evolutionary progression, the, that they know what you've brought in in terms of your skill set that's going to help you to achieve these different desires of evolution, evolutionary progression. And they also are skilled in the experiences that you haven't had in previous incarnations that you're going to have in this particular incarnation. And so really they are, they're there to help in every way, shape and form. So the best thing to do is to meditate on the guide and helpers that are linked in with you so that you can move forwards in a more robust way because 
they're there for you and if you really do concentrate and meditate properly you'll feel them around you anyway they're out of sight some people can pick them up if they um, meditate on them and raise their frequencies and one way of doing that is by using the chakra opening exercises in the previous two world sat sounds we've done but really it's a case of knowing that you can get help but being open to all sorts of different ways in which the help can be given to us and um, you know, and expecting everything and nothing <laughs> because because sometimes it can take a little bit longer sometimes the information can be instantaneous sometimes the information can take a couple of days or even weeks to come through so it's it's, it's just being open to all all functions of communication with us um, and, and being and being patient basically okay next uh, question is from ms and she says hi uh, so creating an event space to be happening in the now, what is now as time doesn't exist? I'm visualizing for my event space to happen now, but it isn't. Is it not happening now as, a, as the time doesn't exist, as the future arrives in the present moment? What is not happening now if that's my visualization? Um, MS continues by saying, I do understand the concept, but I'm aware a lot of people would wonder why as well. If we keep visualizing where we're meant to go in the now, why is it sometimes happening in its, mo why is it sometimes taking a longer time? Why does it sometimes take months and months till things happen? Is it in our life journey to experience and test ourselves even though it can make us ill with the pressure we put ourselves under and the unhappiness? I've been brought up to trust in our maker and I, and I do in my heart of hearts and I know that things will work out. Basically it's all about why is time a delay if everything is meant to be happening now? I meditate and visualize a mantra every day but I'm still waiting <laughs> for my event space to happen. My higher self totally understands the human vessel is under pressure so seeing both sides is interesting i hope this makes sense as usual I have difficulties putting my thoughts into words well i have to say that this is a very good question because if everything's happening now why isn't it happening now but we have to work with some of the event streams and the event stream bubbles as well that i've talked about in the, in the lecture so that's a good question to link in with that sometimes we have to work with certain events that link together now this, this suggests that things are linear. Well, they sort of are and they aren't. They, 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 they exist within and without each other. So the start of one event may be the end of a different event, or the, or the end of one event may be the end of another event and the start of another event. And so if you think about the way in which uh, event streams can, can work and can link in together as being sometimes they are linear but sometimes they're fractals of each other sometimes they link back into each other then, the, then a good way of seeing it as an image is to um, look at a dandelion seed where you've got this this thing that's just it's like a puffball of, of, of seeds that are linked together by these little little um, veins of fluffiness that allow the seeds to travel but if you think about the central point of that particular seed on the, on, the, on, the, on the dandelion is the start of one particular event space and the, all the rest of those things that come off it are basically the, the fractalized versions of that, of that event space. They all link into the same event space but they're all individualized as well. Then think about that central event space on the dandelion uh, seed as being also within the centralized point of one of those seeds <laughs> then you start to see that everything's linked in together. But there are times when the work of our guides and helpers who are working with the other guides and helpers of other individuals who are incarnated within our event space have to work within the event streams and the event stream bubbles that they're working with. And so basically we have to be patient for everything to be in the right event space. So although everything is happening in, in, in the now, there are times when event spaces have to converge to, to make it work properly. And so this is why we sometimes get the human perception of everything happening in different nows or different times you want to use an old the old way of saying it but in essence it's it's all about understanding that from an overall perspective when we are disincarnate everything is happening in the now everything happens instantaneously so all different versions of things happening happen uh, you know ha happen concurrently and it can happen concurrently now or concurrently in a month's time now or in three months time now or two years or ten years time 
now or two centuries now it's just about it's all about logging into the different event space that's giving you the version of now that is giving you what you're expecting to be happening because if something is happening now and you're experiencing it now it's because you're supposed to experience it now if you're able to turn off this connectivity with this event space and move into a different event space where the other version of now is happening that would be a version of now in three months time for instance which is a temporal thing but let's try and ignore that as just an example then you bring that three months now into this now <laughs> and therefore you can therefore experience everything concurrently so it's, it's just about working with these different versions of event space event space event space streams and events event stream bubbles so to speak and recognizing that things have to happen around it to create these links together because it's not just event space which is, which is created on its own we create event spaces and so there are individuals who create event spaces that circumnavigate other event spaces and so things that were supposed to happen don't happen and this is this is something that I've experienced and my, my late wife have experienced where things that were you know, we, you, know we go, you go to see a medium or somebody who's qualified to to experience things and say well this is what's you know, I'm seeing this happening and then it doesn't happen it's because something has happened that's, that's, that's negated that particular event stream from being linked in or the event space that you're in being linked in with that event stream or, or the event stream bubble very difficult to get your one's head around but in essence it's all about understanding that everything is, ex is, is ex being experienced in the now it's just that sometimes we're not focused on the rest of nows <laughs> to create it in the now to be able to see it in the now so we have to be patient we are in a very low frequency environment where things don't happen in the way that we know they should happen but we have to work with that level of low frequency because when things are higher frequency we can, we can then access them so it's it's all about working with this working with the level of now knowing it's, knowing it's happening but then being patient or being capable of linking into that that, that version of now that is the desired version of now which is reality of course or being powerful enough in our conviction that we do swing ourselves into these other versions of now or bring these other versions of now into this now so everything is happening concurrently for us well I hope that <laughs> answers that particular question is quite a Quite a big question, actually. Okay, so next uh, next question here uh, from DC again, again from the book of the history of God on page one one five. Source entered. He said, "I effectively split up half of my mass to create over ten billion zillion smaller parts of me." The the only issue here is that, that when I split, not all the entities ended up in the same level of quality. Okay, it seems that different parts of the source entity evolved at different rates. This is the question, basically. In other words, some souls became fully enlightened and some, some souls became spiritual masters. Ascended masters and some like myself are still slugging it out <laughs> on the planet, trying to become better, become more effective, and more efficient and ascend to the highest levels possible in the, way that they, in the best way they can. There are many reasons why some were more efficient and effective than other parts of the source entity, and yet I suspect we are all created in equality. Then the question is, what is... Uh, is what qualities should we concentrate on uh, on what are, what are the various things we should be doing so that we can become an ascended master in effect it's it's all to do with working on navigating through incarnation in a in a seamless way this is how people become self-realized or become paramahansa so to speak paramahansa means that you're like a swan gliding over the surface of a turbulent sea or a turbulent river or water um, showing a part, apparent calmness and collectiveness and competence when everything else is just mayhem <laughs> basically and that's a good example of how to describe it the objective is to navigate be able to navigate through incarnation in a level of acceptance and working with that acceptance to the point where you can modify the level of acceptance to be more coherent with what we want. So, it's, so and, and the other way of understanding of navigation is to be in the physical but not of the physical. To see that it's all a means of experience, learning and evolution. And that there are people here who are fully immersed in their incarnations to the point where they don't consider the fact that they're part of something bigger 
And so in effect, what we have is individuals who are fully awake and aware and, de and therefore have mastered incarnation, they've, they've able to be in the physical but not of the physical, and they don't need to incarnate, although some of them do to help out, to help others evolve. There are those, those who are fully self-realized um, but, but still come back because they they wish to help others again. There are those that are semi-self-realized who have s snippets or or little flashes of, of coherence, so to speak, with the greater reality. And there are those who are totally immersed or submerged in their incarnation and no um, connectivity with anything else other than their incarnate state and the environment that their incarnate state or vehicle is, is, is um, interacting with anyway. So the best way to become an ascended master is to realize all of this, work on yourself, meditate, disassociate yourself from the low frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions that create karma on this planet and then you will have mastered incarnation and you'll notice that things that would have affected you or pressed your buttons before don't affect you and press your buttons. You don't get into arguments, you don't get into, um, sometimes it's difficult by the way, <laughs> you don't get into uh, transgressions with other people, you, you see, you don't get, get worried about certain things in the, in, the, in the planet, you just see it as being something that we have to work with. And therefore, you, you move yourself, you distance yourself away from it all and become detached from the physical whilst also existing in the physical. The problem is with this is that people who see you in this position actually say that you're detached and you're not, in, not, in, not engaging with them. Don't worry about that. That's just a function of them picking up something different about your frequencies. It's very difficult to do, but um, it's something that um, can be done and is done. And in some respects, in some respects, I've been doing it all my life. And when I, when I look back, some of the things that would have affected people big time don't affect me, and, and or didn't affect me. And I've and I've also moved beyond certain levels of, of being affected as well. And, and everything else is just work in progress still with, with me and with with other people who've uh, who supposed spiritual leaders. Um, any any spiritual leader who says they've made it, he's, he hasn't made it at all. You're always working on yourself, and there's always room for improvement. And so. To become an ascended master is a big deal, <laughs> a big, big deal, and something which is a very good aspiration, but takes a lot of time to do. A lot of time, a lot of experience, I should say, rather than time. Thinking about the previous uh, comments and the previous uh, lecture I've just given. Right, so there's another two parts to this particular question, and, and so it goes. Uh, and so another question would be, why do some people apparently do better than others in the process of becoming the best we can? Why are some higher on the scale of consciousness than others? Did we take our eye off the ball? Were we playing, paying attention to the wrong things? Were some given better instructions than others? Or were the trinity excels of some more effic efficient than others? Were their guides and helpers uh, more effective or did they just simply do a better job at pre-planning their embodiments? What is the difference between one soul and another soul? Simply the journey. Um, some souls decide to take a longer period than other souls. Some souls decide to do a fast track level of evolution. And so the depth of experience, uh, even though they're highly evolved, isn't the same as those who may be lowly evolved and have a greater depth of experience. The depth of experience can and does usually create a, a, an increased longevity in lower frequency environments. And so the, the, the evolution is slower. The, the movement forwards is slower because we get caught up in karmic uh, connections and connectivities and links and circles and loops and, and everything else to do with low frequency thoughts, behaviors and actions. So in, in essence, we do get caught up with who, who, are we, who and what we are when we reincarnate. We do decide on different routes to evolve and, that's this, and we, do, we do decide to have different levels of experience and some and different levels of, of, of interaction with others. And, and this is the, the beauty of it all. It's, it's, not, it's not about who's doing well, who's evolving faster than somebody else. It's about how are we all collectively together assisting in the overall experiential and therefore evolutionary progression, not only of ourselves and our true energetic selves, but the source. So we all have a role to play. And sometimes we play a role that is considered to be suboptimal from a human perspective. But in actual fact, Although that looks to be suboptimal from a human perspective, it's very optimal 
in terms of the overall experience that we, that we have and the evolution progression that we have and the speed that evolution progression that we have on behalf of our creator and our creator's creator. So that's how, that's, that's how we have to think about it. It's more, um, it's more to do with an overall experience for the, the collective us, the source, and not just ourselves as an individualized unit of sentience from an individualized unit of sentience from the source. And that's the way to think about it. It's what we're we doing collectively that counts, not, not how we're individually experiencing it. Another set of questions from US, from a, from a reader of US's work. Most psychics with true connection or insight to, to the one all re, what to the one all relay back that there is only one higher self or ID. To believe otherwise is totally false and illusionary. We are in fact one being, only pretending to be many, and then the the one in an, in an endless cycle of creation. You may call these parts over souls, godheads, true entity selves, whatever. But in fact, the illusion of being split. Um, sorry, sorry, but in fact, it, the illusion is of being split. They are all one on an invisible level. So this is what so-called spiritual leaders, leaders are keeping secret. There is only one point of creation. Call it what you will, God or the One, creating through its dreams and elaborate, highly complicated multitude of things. But all is illusion. We shouldn't forget this. That's true. Um, the individualization that we have or enjoy at the moment is transient <laughs> and this is a big issue for most people because they like to have their individuality and this is where the ego sneaks in and tries, starts to take over because it also likes to re retain its individuality. In essence we are just smaller parts of, a, of, the, of the origin, you know, the absolute the all there is. Um, but if we look at it from the structure, from a structural perspective the, the source entities are individualized, smaller individualized units of sentience from the origin. Our true energetic cells are indi smaller individualized units of the, of the source entity. Our souls or aspects are smaller individualized aspects of, of, the, of our true energetic cells. And a shard is a smaller individualized aspect of, of an aspect um, that, it, that is individualized. But everything is the same. If you think of it in terms of Think of it in a, in a human term. The, if you think of the human body as being the origin, and then a, a cell is the source, and then a, an atom, or even the subatomic structure, is what we are, then you can see that we're all part of the same overall being, but just smaller parts of it. And then, but in essence, and although in general these smaller parts of it are part of the overall sentience, they've been given the gift of individuality for a particular evolutionary cycle. And when the evolutionary cycle, um, I, think, I think I need to go through this evolutionary cycle again, and also the, um, how the earth is evolving, this new earth business again, because I think it's, it's worthwhile doing. In fact, I think I'm going to do that as the, as the lecture uh, next next month in August because I think it's good good to go over some of these things again. So we'll, so we'll go over the um, evolutionary cycle and we'll go over the ascension of the earth in the next um, world satsanga. So I think that's a, good, that's a good thing to come out of this particular question. Yeah, because actually we all, we all are part of a bit one bigger entity, it's just that we have got transient individualization. Just to help the bigger entity understand itself in the most minute detail possible. And the only way to understand itself in the most minute detail possible is to separate out some parts of its sentience in, in sizes that are equal to those smallest parts possible. So to be able to understand the dirt inside the rug, for instance, we have to be the size of the dirt inside the rug, or even smaller, to be able to understand the, the dirt that's on top of the dirt inside the rug. <laughs> so we're all part, this, we're all part of this, this, this one thing. We are actually transient individualizations of, of, of a much bigger being. And for me, there's no secret. Um, why would we keep it a secret? It's just that there are those individuals who like to keep things to themselves to try to, for the want of a better word, keep control of others through some form of spiritual control, which is, for me, complete nonsense. Tell people the truth and you can only help them um, in the most positive way by telling them the truth. 
Next question is, there is strong evidence to support that Jesus and Muhammad, etc. never existed and is therefore just another example of evils of religion manipulated by those who want to keep mankind in subjection and maintain the so-called dark matrix. Just, re uh, just read uh, Jordan Maxwell, it'll, it'll blow your mind. Um, do you not think that there are powers on the earth who are trying to um, negate certain good things to try and make people think in low frequency thoughts, behaviours and actions. There is a function called the Illuminati that exists and I'm fully aware of the Illuminati and they have a role to play but their, their role is to provide choice of you know going one way versus another way, feeling one thing rather than another thing, giving us the choice of taking the right route rather than the wrong route and, and there are there have been masters on the earth, Jesus, Muhammad, the Buddha, Confucius, you know, a number of different um, Byzantine versions as well, Pythagoras, Archimedes, etc., who are here to help us understand and move forwards. Mankind itself has prostituted the use of some of these, the, some of the functions and some of the teachings of these individuals to control other individuals around them to gain power, and that's ego. So anything that's happened is, is a function of mankind. It's not a function of what's what reality is. So in this instance, there have been um, all these different individuals. Okay, some of the writings about them are and were out of date at the point of writing them. I mean, the Bible was written about 300 years after the event of, of Jesus um, ascending back to the, the frequencies again. And, and a lot of the things about the Buddha uh, aren't specifically accurate, but because they, because the some of the people who want people to follow them, they aggrandise the the functions of who and what they are. But in essence, we have to think about it in terms of if there is something that is being radical, is it right? Feel within yourself. Does it feel right or not? Does it not, does it not feel right? But also look at it from the point of view of where is it coming from. You know, what's the root of publication? What's the root of, of, of presentation? What's the root of, of broadcast? And again, feel, feel whether it's right or not. We, if we can work on the premise of a minute amount of doubt can be damaging, but also a minute amount of doubt can give us the opportunity to investigate properly, then it's worthwhile going down the route of, of proper investigation. And then what we'll find is that in general, there can be, you know, people can offer alternative views on everything we do. People can offer alternative views to, to suggest that we landed on the moon. People can offer alternative views to suggest there wasn't an atom bomb. People can offer alternative views to suggest that there wasn't a Second World War, there wasn't a Holocaust. You know, we have to be very careful on what we work with. We have to work with the overall reality and not the localised reality. And that's it. Feel and work with the overall reality, or the global reality, for instance, not the, this, the not the localized or the individualized reality, because then you'll find that you can pick up intuitively the, the the correct um, ways forwards so as to how how and what um, the truth is. Okay, so we've got a couple more questions here, and then we can go into the meditation, which is just good because we we are starting to overrun a little bit, which is it's okay. So another person, M.O., not the same person as the other, other M.O., okay? Uh, that's, that other M.O.'s got a question at the end to do about event space again. And the question is based upon a previous question this person uh, has asked about, if the origin and source of self entities laugh, what about Om? Do they laugh too? If they do, what sort of things do they laugh about? Do Om have opposite sense of humour compared to the origin? Uh, because they are uncre the, the uncreated creation. What would be the effect of the origin's laugh to source senses, Om and us? Um, well, basically, if the, if the origin laughs, then we, we will all feel generally very enlightened and very happy. Uh, same with the source entities. Do the Om laugh? Yes, they do laugh, I'm just being told. <laughs> um, there are some, some Om that don't get involved in any form of evolutionary um, responsibility, by the way. They don't get involved in creativity. And they are very sterile on. Um, 
they they don't interact with any others um, they just experience the, the origin but they would also experience the origin laughing and I'm being told that they are interested in this phenomena this interest in, in happiness or joy or, or, or delight but they see it as being <laughs> in some respect a waste of sentience which, which I think is complete nonsense. So, but this, but the, the Om that interact with other source entities do understand the concept of, and are appreciative of the concept of, of joyfulness, laughter, expression, happiness, um, and, and, you know, and joy basically. And, and also that, that, that things can be enjoyed in, in terms of, um, you know, when we create as well. So I think that these are the armor of, of um, that, that are, I think they still need to evolve a little bit. So they're, they're, a, they're a bit too sterile at the moment, even though they're they're the uncreated creations and they are not interacting with, with any other arm or being involved in the evolutionary cycle. They are um, they are they are subject to learning as well, same as everybody else. Um, the, the question on poor, on page four one three in chapter thirty of the Rajin speaks. You talk about a, a resin device with with, with crystals. You did not. You did not use the word, but it is or, organites. Okay. If it is, would you ask the origin? Would it be effective or, or and ineffective, or could be dangerous designs of organites? Um, it would be very helpful to have some tips on how to make them properly because they are so popular. Um, yeah. Well, it's basically a. a I was given one as a gift, basically, and you can go. A lot, lot of these sort of spiritual conferences, you can get them. They're basically. Uh, mixtures of uh, crystals and rare earth metals arranged in certain ways and my understanding is that they they can be beneficial but they can be dangerous and they can be ineffective as well because they need to be joined together properly it's, it's all right having these things in in resin to suspend them in certain positions but they need to be connected properly together and sometimes they need to be laminated together for instance or sometimes they need to be uh, alloyed together to make them working properly. They are simply a device in a way to gather energy um, and sometimes they're a way to transmit energy or amplify energy. So be, just be very, use your intuition when you're seeing these things because to work properly, the person who's done them needs to be, or created them, needs to be really connected. Um, some of them are information that's being given to us again from the Atlantean period. Some of them are basic physics. And some of them are new to us. But I would say that um, I don't know how to make them. Um, I'm being told if I, if I, if I concentrated on and meditated that I would gain inspiration on how to make them properly. But it's not something I particularly need to use. Um, anything that's physical is simply a physical interface with the, with the energetic. And we don't actually need it. It's, it's a way of saying that we're physical beings and we need to have something physical to make something physical work. We don't need to. We just need to know we can do it. And so having something that amplifies energies is actually detaching our, sov our sovereign ability from us and making ourselves lesser than we are. So my thought processes are, why would you buy something you don't need to have? And that would go the same for things like other crystals, rare earth metals, pendulums, various different types of cards as well. We don't need them, just meditate and work hard on meditating, work hard on making yourself pure. And then you'll be able to connect with these different energies and work, and work them in the same way as these other devices purport to be able to work with them. Okay, next question is from the same person. On page 432 in chapter 33 of The Origin Speaks, The Origin was mentioning another entity uh, caught uh, its and all of their source entities' attention, causing them to gather and observe it before, before you. And it, wasn't, and it wasn't one of your peer group. Um, then what was it entity-wise? Where did it come from? Um, what, was it that kept, what was it that caused them to catch their attention? I'm going to read this out again because I don't think it's worded particularly well. I'll say it again. On page 432 and chapter 33 in The Origin Speaks, The Origin was mentioning another entity 
caught its and all of the source entities. Oh, caught its and all of the source entities. Oh, it caught its and all the source entities' attention, causing them to gather together to observe it before before you. And it wasn't your peer group or um, what was it then? Okay, let's have a quick look. Well, actually, it took me a little bit of time to see this because it was more like put page four thirty six in chapter 33 than page 432. Um, the other entity was Source Entity 12 because Source Entity 12 was seen in the book Beyond the Source 2 as moving outside of the current area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness of the origin to help to try to map it out. It had um, evolved in a quite accelerated uh, and bizarrely logarithmic way. And the other Source Entities were uh, created a an event space around themselves so they could all observe, observe me communicating with the origin because it was something that was interesting and, and it also allowed them to communicate with, with, with me collectively as a whole and the entity that was there was actually source entity 12 it was uh, wasn't it wasn't supposed to be there so that's the um, that's that was the entity that uh, caught all of their attention because it wasn't expected to be there there was, a, there was a small part of it still within still within the origin and uh, so that and, and, it, and is therefore still creating a link with the origin in this current area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness. So that's the, that's the reason for that, uh, that particular um, <laughs> event where the origin and this, all the other source entities in the, uh, in the origin speaks suddenly were quite interested to see another, another entity with source entity 12. Okay, last question from MO. This is the original MO. Another question about event space. When asking straight away, is that the same as now? We imagine now to be immediate, but, but is that then putting it into time, which doesn't exist? If you put your vision into straight away and it doesn't seem to be happening, is that from not enough trust? Or are you going in the wrong direction? Your guides are trying to steer you in, and, and guide you, or are you just being impatient? Also, in an event space, you can just vision going forward, you know, going, going forward in a journey and as we refer to the right path, but not knowing exactly where it is. As you know, I do not know where we're meant to be, where we're, where we're meant to be or where we're meant to go, but knowing it's not where we are now is, 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 is important. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, this, this question is sort of linked in with the first response I had on, on event space about everything being now in various different types of nowness. Um, and, there are, and although everything now is now, we have to focus on, on the now that incorporates the rest of now to be able to see what is going to happen now. <laughs> so if something now in, in, the, in the now is going to be in three months time in the now, for instance, and this, I, don't, I don't like using this because it's saying that I'm using temporal sort of methodology here. But if something is, is, three, is, is in the three months forwards part of the now, how do we bring it into this now? Well, we can, but that now is, is is a function of the result of interactions with other entities and beings, including our guides and helpers, and the environments we're supposed to be in to be all working together to, within a particular event space or event space bubble or event space or event stream, so to speak. So it's all about giving ourselves the expansivity to see beyond the immediate now. Let's, let's call it the immediate now and the wider now. Because the wider now is what we can't see, but the immediate now is what we can experience now. Knowing that the immediate now incorporates everything that's happened, will happen, and is going to happen, but that doesn't exist because it's all now, is all concurrently happening. And this is, the, this is the way to think about it. So I hope that answers that particular question. Okay. Right, so we need to go on to the, uh, the meditation, which is to, to sever links with other um, parts of ourselves or, or other, other individuals. So this should be quite a, uh, a quick meditation because there's actually not an awful lot to it, to be honest. It's quite simple to do. So let's just sit in our straight back to chair as normal. If you haven't got a straight back to chair, you can sit on the, on the ground cross-legged uh, or kneeling, but uh, not, not lying down. Um, feet flat on the ground if you're on the straight back to chair, palms uppermost on your upper thighs. Back straight, closed eyes focused on the origin of the third eye, which is in between the two eyebrows and above the bridge of the nose. 
and I just want to see yourself as, as an individual hanging in space. You can see yourself from a distance or you can see yourself in your own body hanging in space, just in space. And then I want you to visualize another version of you. It can be the same as you, um, or it could be another person. And in between you is a, a cord of energy, like a string of energy between you, or a wire of energy between you. And this is the, this is the energy that, or, the, or the link Okay, or the cord, whatever you want to call it, that associates you now with either you in a past life or another individual that you need to sever a link with. So it's the visualization of the other, the other person can be the other you in a past life, which you will intuitively find out which past life it is, and to find out what's causing you to have back pain or knee pain or or headaches, or pains in the neck, or pains in the heart, for instance. Or it can be an individual you particularly want to sever a link with. It can be anybody, it can be a work colleague, it can be a friend, it can be a family member, it can be a, you know, anybody you, you want to sever a link with. It could be just somebody you feel you got karma with. And all you have to do is to, is to just hold that person in stasis, in you in stasis and just visualize that this cable, this, this energy link, is like an electric cable, actually. I use the word right in the first place. This energy link is like an electric cable with two plugs on. One plug that's in you, and another plug that's in the version of you in a past life, or the person you're trying to remove the link from. And just disconnect this cable from both, from both sockets, so to speak. Now bear in mind you may experience that there might be more than one of these um, energy links between you and the other person. It might be you know, one or two, could be ten or twelve or more. Just have to be observant and see how many are there. You can do them all in one go if you wish or you can do them all separately if you want to just practice the, the, the way of doing it. But just disconnect or unplug this cable. Think of it as an energy cable, as an electric cable. Unplug it from the plug in you, and then unplug it from the plug in the person you want to sever, sever the link with, or you in the life that you want to sever the link with. And then just see you have a, an incinerator or a recycling bin by the side of you, and, that, and, that, and put that link in there, and that means that the, the energy of that link is recycled back into source entity energy. And then I want you to, in whichever way you want to do it, Visualize yourself removing the socket, okay? The socket that this energy link, this energy cable plugged into. Because if the socket is still there, the link can be re-established by the individual creating the link or the past life creating the link. So if you want to just imagine that you're taking a socket off the wall in your house, like the electric power point in the wall, just undo the two screws, for instance, Okay, disconnect the wires, unscrew the wires from the socket. Reminding yourself, of course, that you will have disconnected the fuse. <laughs> That's also important in this, this, this particular visualization. Visualize yourself disconnecting the fuse. Undo this, the, uh, the power point from the wall. Okay. And then you can disconnect the wires from this fuse and, and pull the wires out from the fuse box through the little channels or conduit in the wall out of the socket, the patras we call it in the UK, out of the hole in the wall where the socket was. So removing the wires as well. This removes the wires or the, or the internal connectivity within you. And because it's disconnected from the fuse, from the fuses within you, and it's disconnected from the the socket on the wall and it's pulled out of the, the conduit, there is now no connectivity between that point on the wall of you or the point on the wall 
of the person you want to disconnect from or the point on the wall of the, oh, the other part of you in a, in a different incarnation, they, the connection cannot be, not be, not be re-established. And then if you want to, you can fill in the gap, fill in the hole with plaster, if you want to call it that, or just visualize it being filled up with some material and then covered over. And that's as simple as it is. And when you'll find you've done that, when you find that you've recreated this hole within you, and if you want to, you can use the same method of creating this three-dimensional matrix and on, on seven different levels to do it as well. Every level associated with one of the chakras. So I refer to the satsanga we had in, in June to help you know, reconstruct an organ or a, um, or, a body, or, a, or, or a repair of part of the one of the levels of the or one of the layers of the human uh, aura. You can use that function as well to fill the gap in, going from north to south, east to west, and forwards to backwards on the seven different levels associated with the energies associated with the chakras. And that will also fill up the area. It will make it as if there's been no connection there at all. Very simple visualization, but just feel how different it makes you feel. How disconnected from that particular event or that particular individual you feel. Okay? If you simply you use the visualization of plastering up the hole in the wall, that's that's fine. If you use the visualization of creating the matrix from north, south, east, west, forwards and backwards on the first level, and then using your chakras to move up to the second level and doing the same thing there, and then using your chakras to move up to the third level and the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and doing the same thing on those levels, and then coming down the chakras. I missed out the first chakra, but uh, you can you can use the same process. Then that also reconstructs the area and removes the connectivity to have any connectivity there as well. So a very simple process, very short process. Probably, and I do this quite a lot with people, and you can do it for karma, karmic influences between people. Also, while you're doing karmic influences though, make sure that you totally forgive the individual for whatever they've done to you. And also totally forgive yourself for responding in a, a non-effective non or non-optimal way. It's good to verbally speak the forgiveness about yourself and verbally speak the forgiveness to the individual specifically with removing links for karma. If you do this effectively, you might need to listen to this recording two or three times because it's quite quick. Removing the, <coughs> the link, which is represented as an electric lead with two plugs on each end, one plug to us and one plug to the other person, whether it's us in a past life or the person who creating karma with us or the person we want to disassociate ourselves with, with this particular link. And then removing the sockets that allow the, the plugs to connect into. Just like the sockets on the wall of your kitchen, for instance. And then removing the wires from the fuse board as well, so that there's no way of getting reconnected again. And then refilling, then backfilling that area where the socket was. Either by, either by visualizing you, yourself replastering it or regenerating the area by using the three-dimensional matrix means of healing that we used last week, last, last month actually. Okay. And what you'll find is you'll, find, you'll feel much better about the individual you want to disassociate yourself from with the particular issue that you're working on. You won't feel that you're connected to the individual you, you, you've re removed karma from, the karmic link from, and you'll find that any physical manifestations associated with past life issues or injuries or psychological or physiological 
means of departure no longer affect you. So if you had a bad back or a, or a, or a bad neck or a problem with your heart or your lungs or even a joint on your body and you've removed the link that you've intuitively gained from a particular life you may have experienced this you'll notice that physical ailment will disappear as well. It is surprising how efficient and how really effective this particular healing method is. And so really that's it. All we have to do now is to bring ourselves back into the room. Okay, you're getting very good at doing meditations now with me and other people have no doubt. So we went into meditation quite quickly. We went into meditation quite quickly. So we can come out of meditation quickly as well. Again, come back into the room slowly. Take some deep breaths if you need to. Take a drink of water to help ground you. And then just sit silent for a bit and feel how you feel. And although I've not actually removed any connection from anything myself, I've just done it as a, a generalized thing for this particular method of healing, I actually feel very light at the moment. So something somewhere is being released. And I'm fairly sure that you'll feel very light and very enthusiastic and very motivated as well. Because it will bring back a lot of different feelings of motivation and wanting to move onwards and onwards and upwards as well with it. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for listening to this uh, satsanga. It's been about an hour and well, about an hour, just about an hour and a half. Thank you for your time, patience, and dedication. And um, I'm going to thank US ahead of time for doing the transcription for us to help those who can't uh, work with my particular flavour of English. And sometimes it's better to hear things in the physical as well. Um, US also gets the questions up front as well so that sometimes when I can't read the questions properly for the first time uh, or get tongue-tied for instance um, because of the English is being used the the questions we will be written out um, as they've been given to us so that you don't need to worry about the, the particular way that I've uh, done the questions or, re re or read the questions out. Okay, thank you very much again for participating. God's love to you all. Sources, love to you all. Thank you for listening to this particular satsanga on the 28th of July 2018 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and, and the Moore Show. And uh, again, I do um, suggest you look at, it, look, look at Kevin's YouTube channel and all the different pieces of the greater reality that are broadcast via his particular medium and method of uh, broadcasting the greater reality. And um, namaste to you all, blessings to you all, and um, look forward to speaking to you in August. Have a great morning, evening, afternoon. Goodbye. Did you see the aliens in Crete?